Hi, everyone. Welcome to the SAEM Research Learning Series course online lecture titled Presenting Your Research. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Anahita Kalateri. She is a board certified emergency medicine physician practicing in Hershey, Pennsylvania. After graduating from Pennsylvania State University, she attended medical school at the Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine in Erie, Pennsylvania, and completed her residency in emergency medicine at St. Luke's University Hospital in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Dr. Calentari is also an internationally known speaker and author. Her talks range from infectious disease management to physician wellness establish, and establishing a stress mindset and burnout prevention. Her articles and blog posts have been featured on Feminine EM, EM Docs, Kevin MD, Emergency Medicine News, ASEP Now, and Alien. Dr. Kalateri is the recipient of multiple teaching and speaking awards. She was awarded the American College of Emergency Physicians Teaching Fellowship Micro Teach Award and was awarded first place in her category in the American College of Emergency Physicians New Speakers Forum. Most recently, she was awarded the American College of Emergency Physicians Faculty Educator of the Year Award and the Penn State College of Medicine Dean's Award for Excellence in Teaching. Dr. Kalateri is passionate about transforming the culture of medicine from a Grin and Barrett society to one that holds self-care, physical wellness, and community at the center of its values. When not working, she is enjoying life in the great outdoors with her amazing husband and two very energetic young boys. Dr. Calateri, I will now turn it over to you. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. So today we're gonna to talk about presenting your research and I am super excited to be here because I get to talk to a bunch of people who are interested in research and wanna learn different ways of sharing that with other people. And I have to tell you, it is an honor to be in a position to be asked to be the one to help you do this. So I'm really pumped about this entire talk. I have no financial disclosures and I really only have one objective. It is literally to just give you the tools that you need so that you can engage your audience during your slide presentation so they will listen to your amazing work and all of your research. That is it. I am here to give you tools and with the goal that you are going to just blow everyone away with your presentation on your research. We've all been there. We've all been in those presentations where we can barely keep our eyes open. We're yawning. It's as if, you know, we all got sprinkled with a little bit of sleeping dust, but, but why? What is it about these talks that do this to us? We can blame it on slides that violate pretty much every media rule that's out there, but I can tell you, I know of at least one person who does not follow these slide rules and literally you cannot find a seat anytime this person gives a talk. So we can't just blame it on slides. That, that cannot be the only reason. We can blame it on someone being maybe monotoned. You know, I inflect my voice a lot when I talk and some people talk like this when they're giving a talk. But I happen to know yet another very excellent speaker who doesn't have a lot of inflection in his voice. And again, packed, room. We can blame it on the content. We can say, well, you know, it's just so boring. I, I am completely uninterested in this topic. Well, let me tell you something. Believe it or not, I know of yet another speaker who gave one of the most captivating talks I've ever heard about, and it was literally about platelets and TTP. She is so darn engaging that independent of whatever topic you give her, she will blow it away. So what is it that all of these speakers have in common? They tell stories. 
They are storytellers. And that's what a lot of these presentations are. We're taking topics and we're turning them into these stories. And the reason we are all engaged in hearing them is because human beings love stories. We love them. It's part of our lore and our legend. It's what we share with everyone. And so you might be sitting here thinking like, really, stories? I mean, it's true. Having really great slides to go along with your stories helps. Using your voice in order to inflect and engage, of course it helps. And having a topic that everybody is dying to hear about also helps. But at the very, very base of all of this, it is the story. And you might be wondering like, what on earth is this woman talking about? Like, I am not interested in writing a book. Uh, I am interested in giving a presentation on my research. And I'm gonna show you now that there are parallels. So there are five components to the story. There's the introduction. And this is like, if you think about a story, hey, here's all the people, here's uh, the situation in, that they're in, there's like some kind of issue and that's what's happening. Then there's the rising action. And the rising action is these are all the steps that had to be taken in order for people to like address the situation or get to the problem or, or deal with whatever the issue was. Then there's a climax. Climax is where all the action is. This is where everything comes together, the people and the situation. And oh my gosh, all these answers are revealed and holy smokes, what's going on? Then you have your falling action, which is, well, what are all these people going to do now that they've figured out these answers and this problem solved? How, how do they deal with all of this? And resolution is how it all ends. So those are the components of a story. And there are a lot of parallels when we talk about research. Your introduction is the same. Intro is the intro, right? This is your setup. What is the problem that you're trying to answer? Why are you even doing this study? Why did you go down this road and this path to begin with? What are you trying to solve? That's what you're setting up in your introduction. Your rising action becomes your methods. It's everything you had to set up and all the steps you had to take to address the problem or find out the answer or find your resolve. Climax turns into your results. This is your answers now. This is what you've been working towards. This is like, we have it, we have the answers. But then falling action turns into your discussion. Well, now that you have these answers, what do you do with them? How do you address them? What do they mean? How do you interpret this information? And then lastly, resolution is your conclusion. So there are a lot of parallels between a story and your research. Now, there were a lot of different paths that I could take on how are we gonna apply this to our research? And what I thought of, I recently did this little project. I didn't publish it or anything like that. It's kind of a little pilot thing that I did. Um, but I decided I am going to take components of how I would present that in here. And then we're gonna introduce some concepts about media design and setting up this story throughout my mock presentation, if you will. And so mine is flipping a trauma curriculum. That's what we're going to talk about. And this is my title slide. Here's my introduction. So if I do a standard introduction, I'm going to say traditional lectures are passive learning and it's contrary to adult learning. Flip classrooms are active learning environments and are more consistent with adult learning theory. We created a flipped classroom module for EM residency didactics. There were three main problems that led to this. Consistently, I'm literally reading my slides to you. So what this slide did right, because it did do something right, I used pictures and words. So if we look at Mayer's multimedia principles, and that's M-A-Y-E-R-S, Mayer's multimedia principles, we can check off the very first one, which is use of multimedia. So what that's saying is you wanna be able to use pictures and words instead of just words alone, okay? You don't want just words, you want pictures and words. And so I did that, but I broke a whole lot of other rules, all right? So let's just kind of 
take that picture aside and let's focus on everything going on on the right of this slide here. First of all, the font is really small, like really small. No one in the back of the room is going to be able to see this at all. When I'm using Keynote, I try and stick around a, um, a font of like 150 points, I guess. I would say you're probably safe between 100 and 150 points in Keynote. PowerPoint, you really don't wanna go less than about 40 points. I can't speak to any other presentation media because I don't use any other presentation media. Like I don't use um, Prezi and, and, and those things. So I'm just gonna kind of speak to these. So that's way too small. We gotta fix that. I then violated two of Mayer's other principles and Alan Pavio's dual coding theory. And we're gonna get into the dual coding theory in a minute, but before we do, I'm gonna to talk to you about these other two principles. So the principle of modality says that spoken words and use of images is better than written words and images. So I got a lot of words and I read them all. And oh, by the way, here's the little picture that I threw in. We also wanna avoid redundancy, which I violated because I put up words and I read them to you. So really reading slides is a no-no. Having all these words and then reading the slides is not something that we want to do. If we get into Pavio's dual coding theory, our brains process the world based on two different channels. One is words, like words that we see and that we hear. The other is images, okay? So we see images. So in time, we take this right here, this image, and we have heard the words and have read the words, and we know now that this is earth or the world or a globe, and, and that's how we process it. When we go from that to this, we're doing a couple of things. First of all, our brain, when it sees words, automatically goes into read mode. All of you right now are trying to read that little slide because you can't help it. That's what your brain does. It's what it's telling you to do. When it comes to learning, there's a problem here. So first of all, there's no, there's no image. I removed that channel altogether. So all we're looking at are the words. And your eyes and your brain, your eyes and your ears process words at different speeds. So your eyes are gonna read at about 180 to 200 words a minute, but your ears hear at a slower speed. It's about 100 to 125 words a minute. So this creates discordance for your brain and your learning is compromised. On top of that, your brain's like, nope, I'm not doing this. And people just stop paying attention. So if this is what you're going to do to present your brilliant research, no one's going to hear it because they're all ignoring you now. So we need to avoid that as well. So if we go back to our original slide, we know we have to fix all that text on the right-hand side. But before we do that, I want to focus on the left-hand side. Per mayor, I violated coherence. Coherence says you need to remove irrelevant images and wording. And although we're talking about trauma and although this is a picture of a broken bone, it's just kind of hanging out. Like it doesn't add to anything. What did I talk about? I talked about, I needed to do this flipped trauma curriculum. I needed to do it because what we were doing now wasn't working. ITE scores were low. My faculty left all of these openings in the didactic schedules. Like the, you know, it was all passive learning. And so I wanted to change it up a little bit. A picture of a broken bone has nothing to do with that. So yes, you need to use images, but you have to use relevant images. So I need a better image for this than my broken bone. The other thing I did was I framed a frame. Now, I'm going to give you these resources at the end, but Gar Reynolds wrote this book called Presentation Zen, 
And Nancy Duarte also wrote a book called Slideology. And they talk about that in here. So if you look closely, do you see this little gray line around my image? I don't want that. You want this to be able to flow into your slide and make it look like it all belongs there together. So that gray line doesn't need to be there. So if we go back to this whole thing, let's redo a few things, all right? So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna find a relevant photo. If I want to show a board, or if I'm talking about a bored or disinterested learner, well then let's put in a picture of a bored or disinterested learner. And this is one every educator can relate to. Like you're out there, you're giving a talk and people are on their smartphones. And so this is what I think of when I think of a bored learner. And I like to include humans because humans like to see pictures of other humans. So whenever it's possible, I use images that incorporate other humans. I'm also mindful of who is depicted and how they are depicted in the images because I don't wanna be biased in my talk. So if I'm giving a talk to women and I do that, I travel a lot and I give um, talks to women in medicine everywhere. I will use almost every image I have is of a woman. Race will vary, ages will vary, body habits will vary. So I incorporate kind of these different physical external characteristics so that I can have everyone feel welcome in my talk. I don't wanna make anybody feel unwelcome by excluding an image that they may relate to. If, I am, if I'm giving a talk to a mixed audience of, of different sexes, uh, and different ages. I will incorporate that in my pictures. If I'm giving a talk to what I know is going to be a younger audience, so let's say, you know, traditional medical students, traditional path medical students, I will then incorporate images of people who are younger. And the reason I do this is, again, I want the audience to see these images and relate to it and feel like they are part of it. So it is very important that you pick out relevant images. So now let's look at the text. So like I said, it looks like the main things I'm trying to communicate here is that our program had some issues with our trauma didactics and we needed to fix them. Because we wanted to incorporate adult learning theory, we picked the flipped classroom. So I can get rid of that and I can just say, here's my introduction, okay? Uh, these are the three problems that we had. Uh, in order to address these problems, we decided to use a flipped classroom uh, in order to achieve goals A, B, and C, right? You could just say something like that. This already looks remarkably better than what it was when we started out. You can make it, you can go one step further with this. We were still framing in a frame. Like if I go back to that other image, we're still framing in a frame here. We can just make the whole slide our picture, okay? This is really uh, a great visual, but we have an issue with our text. So I can just simply put in this text box behind it. And yes, technically it's a frame within a frame, but it's of words, it's not of another image. You also notice I changed my font color to orange. Um, you have to make a color, you can choose a color that makes sense to you. For example, you're not gonna use a yellow on a white background. Like yellow on this would not look good. It would be very hard to read uh, from a distance. I mean, it's not that easy to read close up. So it would definitely be hard to read from a distance. Um, you could put yellow on a black background though, or really dark gray. Um, so if there's a dark background, you can use yellow. I also avoid red and green in my text because some audience members are gonna be colorblind. So if I write something in a color that they're not gonna be able to see, I've just excluded them from participating and engaging with me in my talk. I like, I picked orange because I like orange. Uh, there's really not issues where you can't see orange and it's been the color that I've committed to for about the last five or six years. Um, you can use black on white. 
you can use white on black. You don't have to use colors. This is where style points come into play. We can go yet one step further. We got rid of our introduction heading and I can just go right into it. I can go in from my title slide right into here and say, our program faced several challenges with trauma didactics. Every year, our ITE scores were below the national average in the category of trauma. I had faculty members who were not engaged with the topic. Therefore, we had several open hours of conference. And then on top of that, when we were able to get someone to come give a didactic on trauma, it was usually a one hour passive activity. And so we knew we needed to make changes and we wanted to embrace active learning. So we incorporated a flipped classroom trauma module. That's it. That's my whole intro. This one slide, and I said everything I needed to say. If we go into methods, choose an image that captures your methods. You can use anything that, that's out there and throw up a few text boxes, just like we did at the end of our introduction slide. Or you can just explain your methods. You don't have to have a heading here. There's no rule that says you absolutely must have a heading. So I can say, you know, for our study, we use the mixed methods to some degree. Uh, as I discussed, we did use a flipped classroom uh, methodology for instruction. So we needed to select prep materials. We chose to select blogs, podcasts, and journal articles. We used the previously validated Alium Air score to select those materials. A pretest with the reading materials were distributed to the residents two weeks in advance. Our didactic session consisted of three to four case-based discussions done in small rotating groups over about an hour. We used the last 30 minutes of the session in order to debrief the cases. A post-test along with a course evaluation that had some text boxes that were open for comment was then distributed to all those who participated in the didactics. Pre-test and post-test scores were compared using statistical analysis and quotes were pulled from the text boxes for a quasi-qualitative evaluation. There was no coding involved, so it did not meet the exact requirements of a qualitative study. That's it. That is the entire methods. And I just put this up because I did use a Likert scale for the post-evaluation. Next, you move into your results. We're in the results part of our story now. These are my results. 23 of 30 residents completed the pretest, which was in the abdominal trauma module. Post-test evaluations were also given. Testing tools consisted of 14 questions. The number of correct answers increased all question, in all question categories. Additionally, residents felt their knowledge improved and enjoyed the teaching format. We know this is terrible. Like this is terrible and we have all seen it. There are so many things wrong, but one of the things that I'm going to highlight here is we want to utilize the signaling principle. What that is, is we need to highlight the essential materials. So we can just do that in a graph. So I'd put up this graph. But if you look at the graph, it's still, it's fuzzy. It's not very clear. People are going to struggle with that because when we look at something, our brain wants things to be crisp and clear. It doesn't like these fuzzy things. And there's still a lot going on. It's like really, really busy. Have I really pared down the most essential bits of my data? No, I can take it one step further. I could take all of the test questions in my pretest and post-test, put them in categories of what they fall into, and then show the changes in each of the categories. So rather than show the score for each, I chunked things into sections. When you chunk things into smaller sections, that's called the segmenting principle. For my Likert scale data, I could put it up or I can just say 91.3% of the residents agreed or strongly agreed that the session increased their knowledge and 73.9% enjoyed the format of the session. That's it. That is, that is my data for this very small little study that I did, right? And that's how I can present it. You wanna pare it down into its simplest form. 
for the discussion, this is where you're analyzing your data now. You can bring up your, li your limitations. You can find an image that kind of um, encapsulates whatever some of your limitations are. You want people to see that image and then be able to listen to your words and process what it is that you're saying. So for my discussion, I put in this light bulb with all these different gears and churning. Because to me, the discussion portion of research is just that. It's the part where you're kind of now analyzing. The gears are turning. What do these numbers mean? What new ideas do I have, right? Because the discussion is where you come up with, you know, future research questions that after you've taken a deep dive into all of your data, you may have a different pic uh, uh, image that you think is really going to capture that. And then for my conclusion slide, the conclusion based on data from this small pilot study is a flipped classroom teaching strategy that utilizes small groups, case-based discussions can effectively teach emergency medicine residents trauma topics. I mean, that's literally my conclusion, right? And so I guess a limitation that I left off on the discussion would be it was really small. But the good news is, is that this is actually just one little module that's part of an eight module curriculum. And so I can just say, well, you know, future study is that we're going to do more of these modules and add up our data. And then this is my conclusion. And your conclusion can, you can capture any kind of image. I use this because it's a small group. Uh, they have some computers out, they have some notebooks out. It was literally what it looked like during our um, didactics when people were doing their case discussion. And that's what I, in I included for my conclusion. Last are your references. We all put up references, right? Everybody loves references. There's a lot of words here. These are my references for this study that I did, this study that I did. Or you can just put in a QR code. And so you, you open up some kind of share file, whether it's like Dropbox or um, Google Drive, put all your references in there. And then take, you have to make sure you set it up, uh, your sharing is set up so um, that anyone can access it. You then take the URL of that file and go to any QR code generator, drop it in and you can put it in here. This is actually something really great to do on posters. I know today we really kind of stuck with um, PowerPoint. If we're giving a PowerPoint presentation, I'm happy to come back and talk to all of you about posters as well. Um, but this is a nice little pro tip that you could use on either a talk or poster because everybody has smartphones now and it takes up way less space. All right, a few other pro tips. Uh, I know you're, you're all excited. You wanna hurry up and, and get to work and do these little things that I showed you. Um, but I want to give you a couple other pieces of info before you go off and do something amazing. Start on paper. So even for this talk that I prepped for all of you, I've given the whole how do you give a presentation talk in, in various capacities uh, all over the place. Um, I've done slide design. I've done like three-hour workshops on this. I knew that this was going to be a session geared towards people who want to present their research and they wanna present it well. So I had to make some modifications and I started out on paper. I mean, I don't have the exact paper, it's actually downstairs. It would have been wise had I brought it, but it's just pen and paper. I write my ideas down, I draw little squares, right? And kind of think of what kind of image might capture whatever it is I wanna convey on that slide. Then when it comes time to getting the computer out and putting everything together, all I need to do is search for the images, which leads me to my next tip. You need large images. Uh, the day of Zoom is going to come to a close. Uh, and so that's nice. But that also means that the day of the big projector is gonna come back again. And so you wanna make sure that your images are large enough so that when they are blown up on a big screen, they don't pixelate. So you wanna look for at least 1280 by 720, okay? You want high quality images. Now I will tell you this can be very 
expensive. Unless you are someone who is giving all kinds of tops, I do not recommend dropping money into Shutterstock or Adobe uh, images or any of those things. I would go to some of these free places. So Pixabay, ha it's free and it has these very large, high quality images. You can pull some really good high quality images off of Wiki Commons as well. Do not use a stock photo where there is literally the copyright written across it in your talk, okay? You can find images out there. You can also uh, use it on Google, but it gets a little, it gets a little hairy with some of the copyright laws on there. So I, I don't want to get into that on this talk, but you, you really want to make sure you are not using copywritten images and uh, that you are not using kind of that copyright stamp image. It doesn't make it any better if you've kept the stamp on it in your presentation. Pixabay and Wikicommons are really, really good um, websites to get these images. If you want to experiment with color, you want to use different combos. I kind of have my colors that I work with. Uh, I know what I like. I, in every single one of my talks, there's the same color combo that I've come up with. Maybe you want to come up with something. Color.adobe.com is a great website that you can use that will show you all the different color combos. Unless you are presenting internationally and know that there is going to be a square screen, use widescreen. We are in the day and age of widescreen. There's widescreen TVs, widescreen projectors, widescreen laptops. We are not using those little squares anymore, okay? So international, some places they do still have square projectors. Some smaller institutions may still have some square screens and projectors. So I would just check ahead of time and find out what kind of formatting do you need to use? If they say we use widescreen, do it, go for widescreen. I use these resources, for, these three resources are literally my go-to for everything. So it's, and I don't own stock in any of these. Like I said, I have no financial disclosures. I am friends with Ross Fisher. Um, so I guess I should disclose that, but me sending you to his P3 website, um, I, I don't think he gets money. I, I doubt it. I mean, it's like a faux med thing, but it's the P3 website, Nancy Duarte Slideology and Presentation Zen are the, that is it. And consider that your references for this talk. Um, sure, you can Google Mayor Multimedia Principles. You can Google Alan Pavio's uh, dual coding theory. Uh, but these three, if you want to deep dive and really learn how to present data and how to give talks and how to engage, these are your three to go to. And that is it. Those are your tools. That's everything. And you can go start building now. If you have any questions, this is my Twitter handle. Um, I have it set up so that anybody can message me, which is sometimes a little bit uncomfortable, but I am happy to receive all of your messages. Uh, otherwise, you can email me directly. This is my email address. It's like the longest email address in the world, but that's what we have here. And I just thank you so much for this opportunity. I am so happy that I got to be here with all of you. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Calentieri for this very informative presentation. And thank you to everyone watching this presentation for the SAM Research Learning Series. Have a great day.